If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some gamer score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Z Retro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Hello my fellow Latter-day Saints, Ken Z Retro here, uh, back once again, it is... This is it, folks, the season finale of the Trophy Achievement Podcast, your one-stop shop for all the latest gaming news, rumours, and those points and trophies. But there will be no points or trophies this week because, well, here we go. The final episode, and it's just going to be news and the Battle of the Free Games for December 2018. Who's going to get that last point so that they have the advantage of going first for the best free games for January 2019? So let's not waste any more time and let's get right into it. Before that, as always, a big shout out to Boomerang Rentals. Packages start from as little as $3.99 a month. Sign up today, get a 21-day free trial, and you get three free game, uh, three free game rentals. There are no late fees. You can keep the game as long as you like, or keep it forever at a discounted price on the online store. You can play the latest games for as little as $9.99 a month. So yeah, in my case, putting together my top 10 games of 2018... I'm going to have a fun task with that one. But anyway, here we go. It is time to get started. That's boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. So let's not waste any time and let's get right into this week's news. And my goodness me, Nintendo are in the good books of gamers. How's about that? Now, why would this be? They have announced they are going to be ending its creators program. So here we go. Let's see what we've got. Here we go. Nintendo has announced an end to its controversial creators program. The company announced the news via Twitter, along with a brief statement explaining... The program will close, will come to a close by the end of December. Nintendo is ending the program to make it easier for content creators to make and monetize videos that contain Nintendo game content. The system is no longer accepting new videos and channels, nor will Nintendo review any remaining in the queue. Creators can continue showing their passion for Nintendo by following the company's guidelines, which were updated along with today's announcement. Now, let's have a look at these guidelines before we move any further in the article. Right, so here we go. Uh, We are humbled every day by your loyalty and passion for Nintendo's games, characters, and world, and respect that you want to be able to express yourself creatively by sharing your own original videos and images using content from our games. As long as you will follow, as long as you follow some basic rules, we will not object to your use of game footage and or screenshots captured from games, which Nintendo owns the copyright to Nintendo game content in the con- for which Nintendo owns the copyright uh, in brackets Nintendo game content in the content you create for appropriate video and image sharing sh- sites. To help you gu- to help guide you, we prepared the following guidelines. So here we go. These are the guidelines. Which means you may see some Nintendo games in throwback birthdays later down the road. We'll just see what happens. You may monetize your videos and channels using the monetization methods separately specified by Nintendo. Other forms of monetization of our intellectual property of our intellectual property for commercial purposes are not permitted. Whatever that means. We encourage you to create videos that include your creative input and commentary, videos and images that contain mere copies of Nintendo game content without creative input or commentary are not permitted. You may, however, 
post gameplay videos and screenshots using Nintendo's system features, Nintendo system features such as the capture button on Nintendo Switch without additional input or commentary. You are only permitted to use Nintendo game content that has officially been released or from promotional materials officially released by Nintendo such as such as product trailers or Nintendo Directs. So reacting to Nintendo's conferences from E3 are going to be a lot easier. Which reminds me. Right, so anyway, here we go. You are only permitted to use yada yada yada. If you want to use the intellectual property of a third party, you are responsible for obtaining any necessary third party permissions. You are not permitted to imply or state that your videos are officially, officially, officially affiliated with or sponsored by Nintendo. We reserve the right to remove any content that we believe is unlawful, infringing, inappropriate, or not in line with these guidelines. Please understand that we will not be able to, to respond to individual inquiries regarding these guidelines. Also, we may update these guidelines from time to time, so please refer to the latest version before sharing your content. Hmm. And we've got, we've got a few questions here. 11 questions. Okay, let's have a look. Frequently asked questions. What type of content... What types of content are acceptable under the guidelines? What types of content are not acceptable? We encourage you to use Nintendo game content in videos and images that feature your creative input and commentary. For example, Let's Play videos and video game reviews are within the scope of the guidelines. Excellent. If I, what, once I get a Nintendo Switch, I can review Nintendo games. Fantastic. For creative input and commentary. For example, uh, da, 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 da. however, you may not sim you may not simply upload or live stream an existing Nintendo video gameplay footage without your own creative input or a copy of content created by someone else. For example, mere copies of Nintendo promotional videos, tournaments, music soundtracks, gameplay sequences, and art collections are outside the scope of the guidelines. Right. So if you were to say use a piece of music from a Nintendo game, like in my case, I some I use uh, the Nintendo, uh, I use the Kirby Return to Dreamland theme. Uh, I I use that for um, my blooper reel in um, Everything Wrong with Tom and Jerry. That would get that would get a copyright. Um, that would get content ID'd right out of the gate. So that makes sense. Hmm. Question two, do the guidelines only cover video uploads or can I live stream my videos as well? Yes, the guidelines cover both uploads and live streams. Okay, what do you mean by appropriate video and image sharing websites? We generally accept most commonly used video and image sharing platforms such as, but not limited to, YouTube, Twitch, and Instagram. However, we reserve the right to remove any content that we believe is unlawful, infringing, inappropriate, or not in with the guidelines. Question four, what exactly are the monetization methods spe separately specified by Nintendo as referred to in the guidelines? Currently, the monetization methods separately specified by Nintendo include the following. Facebook or Facebook Game Streamer, Facebook Level Up Program, Ninconico Duga, Nin Ninconico Live, or whatever that is, OpenRec.tv, Twi Twitch, the Twitch Affiliate Program and Twitch Partner Program, Twitter Amplify Publisher Program, and YouTube Partner Program. Subject to okay, right. Um, so going back to that one. Um, Um, uh, ah, right. So you may monitor. So I could monitor. So if I were to do some Smash Bros. gameplay and I wanted to monetize it, it would be a okay. But if I was to use Nintendo music in the background, that wouldn't be allowed. And it wouldn't be monetized, and thus a content ID claim. So that clears just as well these FAQs. Um, just as well these FAQs uh, manage to clear things up. 
Can I sell content that I create or upload and upload or live stream on a sharing platform if it includes Nintendo game content? No. You may not sell any videos, music, or images that you created using Nintendo game content. So you couldn't sell your fan arts online. But you could sell it at, say, a local Comic Con, for instance. Can I create, upload, and live stream content that is based on other Nintendo intellectual property outside of gameplay footage and screenshots such as fan art? Literally what I just mentioned. Right. The guidelines only cover the sharing of Nintendo game content on appropriate video and image sharing sites. Any other use of Nintendo's intellectual property and creation of content outside of this scope is subject to the relevant laws of the applicable jurisdiction. Nintendo cannot provide legal advice to you, so we encourage you to seek your own legal counsel if you have any questions about whether your particular proposed use is permitted. Interesting. Fan art, fan fiction, hmm, who knows. What if, I, what if I record someone playing an unreleased game at a public event, such as a gaming expo? Please keep in mind that most public events have filming guidelines and you are responsible for following those guidelines. If you are unsure, please check with on-site staff before uploading or live streaming your video. We also reserve the right to remove any content that we believe is unlawful, infringing, inappropriate, or not in line with the guidelines. I have a feeling we're gonna be hearing some, uh, insert, uh, blah, 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 inside, uh, blah, 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 guidelines. I have a feeling we're gonna be hearing that a lot. I am planning to host a gaming tournament using Nintendo video games and upload or live stream a video of that tournament on the applicable video and image sharing sites. Are these activities subject to the guidelines? Okay. Uploading and live streaming Nintendo content from a Nintendo... Ah, right. Uploading and live streaming Nintendo game content from a Nintendo authorized or licensed tournament is within the scope of and subject to the guidelines. However, hosting a tournament is a separate activity that is outside the scope of the guidelines. Ooh. Ah, uh, okay. That makes things a little interesting as far as creating tournaments are concerned. Under the guidelines, can corporate entities upload or live stream videos and sc screenshots using Nintendo game content? The guidelines are only applicable to individual consumers using Nintendo game content. Okie dokie. Will there be cases where Nintendo will remove content from sharing platforms? Yes, we reserve the right to remove any content that we believe is unlawful, infringing, inappropriate, or not in line with the guidelines. In some cases, Nintendo may take down videos on behalf of our third party partners. What do you mean by content that is unlawful, infringing, or inappropriate? Examples of unlawful, inf infringing, or inappropriate content include, but are not limited to, content that incorporates Nintendo intellectual property and violates applicable laws, infringes the intellectual property rights of Nintendo, and or features pirated Nintendo software. So pirated copies of Super Smash Bros that just got leaked earlier this week, for example, that would be a big no-no. So anyway, back to the article. Here we go. The program which launched in 2015 granted registered users 60% of the advertising revenue for videos containing content from Nintendo games. The system worked in parallel with a second agreement with YouTube where videos with a certain amount of U Nintendo content would be flagged. Creators could keep their video live by adding Nintendo advertisements to their videos, with proceeds from these videos being split between Nintendo and YouTube. The, Nintendo's creators, the Nintendo Creators program drew criticism from content creators and community figures with the rules surrounding monetization being seen 
as overly restrictive and harsh in 2017. The release of Super Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild reignited the conversation about streaming Nintendo games. YouTubers were hit with copyright claims on their videos, which led to them being demonetized by YouTube's system. Nintendo also restricted live, stream even for, live streaming even for users who were part of the official program and playing one of the approved games, even if it was for non-monetized purposes. This change will likely be welcomed warmly by streamers, especially in light of a high of the highly anticipated release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate! Nintendo's new guidelines encourage creators to make content with active commentary and creative input, a fancy way of saying Let's Plays. The statement is brief, but ends with a message of support for content creators, noting that we appreciate and encourage the continued support of content creators and thank them for their dedication to help us create smiles. Yay! Damn, I wish I had money. Damn, I wish I had the money for a Nintendo Switch right now. But hey, one of my friends has a Nintendo Switch, so what am I going to do? I may add Super Smash Bros. Ultimate to my list on Boomerang Rentals, and then take it from there. Here we go. So this is it. Next up, Fallout 76's $200 Power Armor Edition wasn't what buyers were promised. TRAITOR! Thank you, Kylo Ren. No plans to offer advertised items. Okay. Bethesda originally advertised a canvas West Tech duffel bag as one of the items that would come with the $200 power arm edition of Fallout 76, but fans were surprised by the quality of the item that ended up shipping with the final product. Basically, People who bought the collector's edition were given a cheap nylon bag to house the power helmet that doesn't match the product description or image of a West Tech canvas carrying bag, an individual wrote on Reddit. In the product listing to this day, it still says it's a canvas bag and even looks completely different to what was delivered. This is how the package, including the bag, was originally advertised. This and this is the and this is an image of the nylon bag that was shipped. It still says West Tech on it, but beggar's belief. So they used nylon instead of canvas. We checked our own bag from our Power Arm Edition and... Yup! It's nylon! And also pretty flimsy. The official wording of Bethesda's page has been adjusted to, slate to state that the bag is nylon, although the listing still includes the image that states the bag is canvas. Players are also reporting that the company that company response to this switcheroo has been less than friendly. We are sorry that you are unhappy with the bag, Bethesda's support reportedly told another fan. The bag shown in the media was a prototype and was too expensive to make. I'm sorry, too expensive to make. Have you seen the money you made from previous games? You may as well have not had the bag to begin with! We reached out to Bethesda for comment. We're investigating res the response from the Bethesda Gear, Gear Store support team and we apologise to the customer who took the time to reach out. 
Professor told Pol Polygon in a statement, the support response was incorrect and not in accordance with our conduct policy. Unfortunately, due to unavailability of materials, we had to switch to nylon a nylon carrying case in the Fallout 76 Power Armor Edition. We hope this doesn't prevent anyone from enjoying what we feel is one of our best collector's editions. <laughs> best collector's edition? Have you seen the state of the game? I actually played this! I played this garbage! I played seven. I played Fallout 76! Outside of the soundtrack... Was there anything good about it? There was one quest where I was constantly bombarded by these mini robots. And I was just like, robots, go away! Oh, and there's an update now. Bethesda is now offering 500 atoms. Fallout 76 is virtual currency worth around five dollars to players impacted by the switch. Good grief. Even Bethesda has microtransactions! Oh my word. No, no, Bethesda, what have you done? What have you done, Bethesda? What have you done? 500 atoms is barely enough competition. Five dollars worth for a two hundred dollar collector's edition. <sighs> Flat out unacceptable. Anyway, moving on to the next piece of news, and oh, Fridge. Yeah, this doesn't look good. This does not look good, folks. This does not look good by any stretch of the imagination. Gamer arrested over rape after rape overheard during a Dry Theft Auto session. Oh my goodness me. Oh boy. A Florida man has been charged after he was allegedly overheard raping a teenage girl during a gaming session, US media report. Oh, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Reports say Daniel Enrique Fabian, who's 18, was playing Grand Theft Auto earlier this year when he allegedly assaulted a 15-year-old girl during a game break. Are you serious? Another player told police that Mr. Fabian left a microphone on and he heard a female in distress saying no. Oh my word. The alleged victim told police she was held down and raped by Mr. Fabian. The, a police affidavit. Affidavit, uh, how do you pronounce that, says a medical examination supported the teenager's claim, local media report. The assault is said to have occurred in June at Mr. Fabian's home in Newport Ritchie, Western Florida. Reports claim he made a, a lewd comment about having sex with a girl he had coming over before he returned to gameplay about 15 minutes later. It is not clear whether the other gamer was the person who reported the alleged assault. Local network WFLA reports. The 18 year old was arrested on Wednesday and has been charged with two counts of lewd and la lascivious battery on a victim between ages 12 and 15 years old. Local media say he is being held on a $30,000 bond, which equates to about £23,000, at a local detention centre. He raped! A MINOR! THIS GUY RAPED A MINOR! ARE YOU SERIOUS? 
this gang raped a minor, he should be jailed, not in a detention centre. Further proof of how messed up the justice system is. He only gets held in a detention centre. Where do I even begin with that? Anyway, back to Fallout, and what Fallout 70, Fallout 5 can learn from Fallout 76. Fallout 76. Fallout 76 is Bethesda Game Studios' first foray into multiplayer for the popular series. Unfortunately, its launch has drawn tepid response, to put it mildly. In other words, the game is garbage! So here we go. But what it has undoubtedly succeeded in doing is generating even more anticipation for a new single-player Fallout game. And while 76 may not have stuck its landing, it does have a few ideas worth carrying forward, and some lessons that should definitely be taken to heart. Here are five things Fallout, 7, Fallout 5 can learn from Fallout 76. Simple. DON'T MAKE IT MULTIPLAYER! Anyway. Here's every Fallout review score from IGN. First, uh... Hmm. They never actually reviewed the original Fallout game. Hmm. I am severely disappointed you didn't review the original Fallout. Fallout 2, 8.9, Fallout Tactics, 8.3, Fallout Brother of Steel, 7.5, Fallout 3, 9.6, ah, reviewing the DLC, Fallout Operation Anchorage, 7.8, Fallout 3, The Pits, 7.5, Fallout 3, Broken Steel, 8.5, Point Lookout, 8.5, Mothership Zeta, 7, Fallout New Vegas, 8.5, Dead Money, 6.5, Honest Hearts, 7.5, Old World Blues, an 8, Lonesome Road, 6.5, Fallout Shelter, 6.8, Fallout 4, 9.5, Automatron, 7.5, Wasteland Workshop, 5.5, Far Harbor, 8.3, Contraptions Workshop, 6.8, vault -Tech Workshop, 8.2, Nuka World, 7.9, Fallout 4 VR, 7.9, Fallout 76, a very disappointing 5. Anyway, the 5 things. Number 1, it's past time to recreate creation. While Fallout 76 looks spectacular in some places, especially when the lighting and atmosphere really click, the creation engine's technical limitations were conspicuous in Fallout 4 back in 2015. In 2018, they are inexcusable! Fallout 76's performance is hindered by frequent stutters, game crashes, and launch consoles struggling to maintain a res reasonable frame rate. Not to mention the lack of a field of view slider. It's a shame the creation engine is known for, their, of, for these issues, and not as an efficient design platform both Bethesda and modders expertly use to build bigger, better worlds. The next Fallout game is unlikely to use a new engine, but we can at least hope Bethesda is willing to go to whatever lengths are necessary to bring creation up to par. And because a ridiculous advert has popped up on uh, the article, when I clearly have adblock enabled, yes, I can say I don't care. Just let me get on with it. Number two, perk cards are a welcome change. Hmm. I'll admit I like the perk. I've already clicked. I consent. Go away! 
per Kodro Rokuji. Fallout 76 has yet again drastically revamped the series trademark perk system, substituting the traditional skill tree or menu for, for hot swappable cards. This allows for greater flexibility of character builds and traditional. And I was seeing. Uh, this allows for greater flexibility of character builds, introduce, introduces random progression paths, and the opportunity to easily experiment with different playstyles, like in Diablo 3, which allows you to hot swap between unlocked abilities. Picking early, picking early game perks doesn't feel like a play through defining decision anymore, for better or worse, and swapping cards is a great way to change things up at a moment's notice. The downside is that it comes at, an, an ex, at the expense of making perk choices less meaningful to your character's identity. Some variant of this might be an interesting idea for Fallout 5 to experiment with. Just please don't monetize card packs, okay? Yeah, like I said, I've just, yeah, it's got blooming microtransactions. Fantastic. Number three, build anywhere, anytime. When Fallout 4 introduced base building, it opened up a world of possibilities for creating unique, customized settlements it, as long as it was located in one of a few pre-selected locations. 76 has followed the lead of some Fallout 4 modders and wisely done away with, its, with this arbitrary restriction and lets you drop your camp and start building virtually anywhere that isn't already built on. We just wish we didn't have to spend so much time managing our material stash, swimming in oceans of junk, and fighting the world's geometry to place anything down. For a game that is about collecting resources and building, 76 sure makes it a hassle to do so. We hope Fallout 5 gives us more freedom to build wherever we please, along with a more permissive, permissive stash system so we can build whenever too. Number four, choices that actually matter in the world. While it's not the first time we've gotten the push the button in a Fallout game, Fallout 76 introduces the ability to launch nukes at any part of the map. The explosion and subsequent radioactivity dramatically changes the look and feel of that area and opens up a high level, opens up high level activity and enemy encounters that are unique. That are unique to the fallout it's a downer though that because this is a shared online world we would be we should be what should be a world altering event is a short-lived and a bit is short-lived and a bit underwhelming We hope Fallout 5 improves on this front by allowing us to launch nukes that are meaningful, permanent, and gameplay changing consequences. That have meaningful, permanent, and changing conse gameplay changing consequences. Right. Factions have to mean something. Fallout 76's absentee factions illustrate to an even greater degree that the conflicts between the groups like the Brotherhood of Steel, the Enclave, and the New California Republic are a big part of what makes a good Fallout game tick. The lesson is, Fallout 5 needs to swing back hard in the other direction and lean into the ability to join and influence the direction of, of, of its factions. In combination with the building mechanics that frequent and frequent NPC on NPC battles, 
there's even potential for a large-scale territory conquest ending to determine who controls the region. Perhaps the most important lesson Bethesda can learn from Fallout 76 is you can't turn back the clock on a bad game. And putting out something that's clearly in need of a lot of work can do irreparable damage to even the most popular series. Just ask Star Wars Battlefront. That's a mistake that it definitely can't afford to repeat. Otherwise, it's bye-bye Fallout. Because Fallout's, Fallout's their cash cow. Here we go. Now things are getting juicy. Because right about a year ago, we had so much backlash from Star Wars Battlefront 2 and now and the now infamous loot box system. Ooh, goody! So what's gonna be happening this time on the latest in the latest episode of The Scandal of the Loot Boxes? Now, here we go. The FTC agrees to investigate loot boxes while the ESA continues to defend them. Right. Right. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission will investigate loot boxes, the chairman Joseph Simmons told a Senate Commerce Subcommittee on Tuesday. Simmons was asked to begin the investigation by Senate Maggie, Hans Ma Maggie Hassan, who has previously... Hassan Shot! <sighs> really, Looney Tunes? ...who has previously raised concerns about loot, loot boxes. Hassan asked! Hassan shot! This is going to be a running gag throughout this article, isn't it? Hassan asked the Hassan shot! The Entertainment Software Rating Board to investigate the way it rates games with loot boxes earlier this year, warning that she'd get the FTC involved if it didn't. There's been reluctance from the ESRB. The, the, the entertainment. There has been reluctance from. The Entertainment Software Association, however, which oversees the ESRB. Oh. My. Word. So the ESA are basically the EA of the ESRB, basically. You will do our instructions. You will not deviate from our rules. ESA President Michael Gallagher defended loot boxes back in May, making him an absolute idiot in the process, and claimed that regulation would impair the ability to of the industry to continually test new business models because loot boxes are poison he doesn't believe loot boxes are connected to gambling um in a star wars game with microtransactions kids love star wars hello when you look at the definitions of gambling throughout the world and how this is done and how it's regulated in places like Las Vegas and the US, it's quite different to the mechanism of loot boxes in games. You are spending money to try and get rare items! He said that conclusion has been reached, in other words, that this game mechanic is not gambling. By the Entertainment Software Ratings Board in the US, by New Zealand's Gambling Authority, and by the UK's Gambling Authority. Hmm. 
Gallico advises self-regulation, but Hassan disagrees. Hassan Shah! In particular, she has concerns about the impact on children. B okay, let's hear those concerns. You're only going to hear the audio, folks. Mr. Chair and, and Ranking Member Blumenthal, thank you for uh, holding this hearing. And thank you um, to all of the commissioners. Thank you for your service and for your testimony and answers today. I want to start by following up on the topic of how we're doing on protecting our kids that Senator Markey started to raise. Earlier this year at the confirmation hearing for most of you, I discussed the possibility of the FTC examining the issue of children in the video game space. Specifically, we discussed loot boxes, which allow in-game purchases with real currency for surprise winnings, and most of you agreed that this is an area that could use additional oversight by the FTC. Loot boxes are now endemic in the video game industry and are present in everything from casual smartphone games to the newest high-budget video game releases. Loot boxes will represent a $50 billion industry by the year 2022, according to the latest research estimates. Children may be particularly susceptible to engaging with these in-game purchases, which are often considered integral components of video games. And just this month, Great Britain's Gambling Commission released a report finding that 30% of children have used loot boxes in video games. The report further found that this exposure may correlate with a rise in young problem gamblers in the United Kingdom. And you have the ESA defending this? Belgium, the Netherlands, Japan, and other countries have all moved to regulate the use of loot boxes in video games given this close link to gambling. Take that, EA! Take that, Activision! Take that, Konami! So given the seriousness of this issue, I think it is in fact time for the FTC to investigate these mechanisms to ensure that children are being adequately protected and to educate parents about potential addiction or not other negative impacts of these games. Would you commit to undertaking this project and keeping this committee informed about it? Yes. Yes. I'm seeing nodding heads. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Holy freaking Luya! Thank you. Um, I also wanted to follow up on uh, something that I know is of an interest to Commissioner Slaughter and Commissioner Wilson. You mentioned it too, so maybe I'll just I'll start with you, Commissioner Slaughter, and then we'll let anybody else who wants to respond. Um, we've discussed. Um, that the heroin, fentanyl, and opioid crisis is our most pressing public health and safety challenge facing both my home state of New Hampshire. Okay. Okay, okay. Right, so she's pretty much... Right, right the, the next paragraph is just basically what she said in that video. Right. She went on to cite a report from... The UK Gambling Commission claiming that reports found that exposure to loot boxes could correlate with an increase in underage gambling. Though the report could have been clearer, it definitely did not correl it did not it definitely did not conflate loot boxes with gambling, however, or even suggest that loot boxes could lead to gambling. Um, it clearly does if she mentioned underage gambling in the UK Gambling Commission report. We've not in any way, we've not in any way in the survey referred to it as exposure to gambling, but it could lead to that! A gambling commission spokesperson said, the reason we've asked that question is that it's a very popular subject matter, and we want to make, try and make sure that we have as much information and data around it as possible. This doesn't mean that an investigation couldn't be valuable. It's exactly why the UK Gambling Commission asked about loot boxes in its surveys in the first place though it certainly could have dedicated more time than a brief paragraph to the topic. A deeper investigation that looks into how loot boxes are marketed, for, the, for instance, or how parents can educate themselves could be extremely helpful. Simple. Look at the age rating on the box and then look at the back to see the reasons why. 
For instance, let's let's see what other games I can find. Let's see what other games I can find. Wait, let's have a look. Right. In my hand right now, I have a selection of games. Let's start with one of the highly anticipated releases, Red Dead Redemption 2. As you can see, rated 18. Reason for that? Strong language, violence, and gambling. No doubt that'll be part of the quests. Next up, Halo 4. Rated 16. And the reason for that, the reason for that rating, this is to come off, is simply violence, and it also has online interactivity as well. F1 2018, I've got the headline, I've got the headline edition by the way, rated Peggy 3. Nothing wrong with that. The only thing here is online interactivity. And that's about it. There we go. Right. Now these are pretty much on the same boat as each other. Kingdom Hearts, rated 12. Reason? Violence. It will be fantasy violence. And then you've got Overwatch, rated 12. Interestingly, why would that be? For the violence, nowhere on this box does it mention anything regarding gambling because of the loot boxes? Now, if the gambling was actually part of the game itself, such as, like I mentioned in Red Dead Redemption 2, like something like Liar's Dice or Poker or something, like, something along those lines. Anyway. After raising her concerns about uh, and asking the FTC to investigate, Simmons agreed with a simple yes. The ESA is sticking to its defense of loot boxes, therefore being idiots in the process, reiterating that they aren't gambling and people can choose not to engage with them. This is of course complete this of course completely sidesteps the issue of their possible impact on children, thus continuing to make the ESA complete idiots who couldn't be expected to know the risk. EXACTLY! And the concern isn't simply that loot boxes are gambling, they could simply be completely different and still be toxic. GAMBLING IS A FORM OF TOXICITY! It's a complicated issue that isn't going to be solved by ignoring it. <clears throat> you know what? One more time, folks. Hassan Chat! Hassan, thank you. And, uh, as soon as this goes live, well, once this goes live, um, this weekend we have got a mega special Community Day weekend for Pokemon Go. Community Day weekend? Um, okay, what's the special, what Pokemon is so special that it deserves an entire weekend? Well, it's not just a Pokemon. Let's read the article. Here we go. Pokemon, De Pokemon Go developer Niantic has announced the first details on the game's next community day, but this one looks to be a little different from previous events. Rather than taking place on a single day, as most community days have, the next event runs over an entire weekend and gives players another chance to capture all the previously featured Pokemon. 
the special community day weekend kicks off on Friday November 30th at 1 p.m. Pacific time 4 p.m. Eastern time which will be 9 p.m. UK time over here in the UK so adjust accordingly to your time zone and runs until 11 p.m. Pacific time on December 2nd 2 a.m. Eastern time on December 3rd which would equate to 7 a.m. on 7 a.m. UK time here in the UK. Again, adjust accordingly to your time zone. During this time, Pikachu, Eevee, Dratini, Beldum, and all of the other Pokemon that were featured during a previous community day will reappear in greater numbers. It's a community day apocalypse! Everyone grab two of each animal and head for the border! The end is nigh! The end is nigh! F***ing run away! The end is nigh! Likewise, you'll have another opportunity to learn the special event exclusive moves that were available during the past community days. Excellent! So, the Pokemon yeah. not pleasant. Not pleasant. So, Let's have a look at all the Pokemon that are going to be featured. I mean, nice early Christmas present for all of us. Which means, I could get a chance to get all the shinies! So let's have a look at what we've got. The Pokemon featured are... The featured Pokemon... The featured Pokemon are, based on when they were released, Pikachu! Released in January, Dratini from February, Bulbasaur from March, Mareep from April, Charmander from May, Larvitar from June, Squirtle from July, Eevee from August, Chikorita from September, Beldum from October, and Cyndaquil from just last month. They're all here! All... Kidoki, all right, oh, whoa, right. On top of bringing back all of the previous featured Pokemon, Niantic is offering a handful of in-game bonuses during the Community Day weekend, as with a typical event. This will only be available during a three-hour window of time, which will vary by region. This time, the bonuses include the double include double the normal amount of XP and Stardust for capturing Pokémon, as well as double incubator effectiveness. Meaning, if you have, say, a 7k Alola egg, catches in 3.5 kilometers. You got a 10k egg, hatches in five. Five k egg, hatches in two and a half. You get the idea. Niantic hosted the first Community Day back in January, and since then the developer has held a new event of for the game each month. Unlike other real-world Pokemon Go events, these typically run for only run for three hours, during which time you can find increased spawns of that month's featured Pokemon. You can also learn a special event exclusive move if you meet a certain criteria before the event ends. You can check out our guides for all the previous Community Day events below for more details on how to get these moves. So, in addition to the upcoming Community Day, a legendary po a new legendary Pokemon is available in Pokemon Go, Cresselia, the legendary psychic type introduced in Gen 4 games Diamond of Pearl, will appear in Raid Battles until December 18th. Niantic also recently rolled out a special research questline that revolves around the new mythic Pokemon Meltan. So here we go. The bonuses are as so basically the your, your usual your usual ten to one. It will be your usual ten to one in the in uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India. Uh, India and Greenland will be ten a.m. to two p.m. Pacific time, and the Asia Pacific region will be ten p.m. till th uh, twelve p.m. till three p.m. Japanese Standard Time on December the second. Now, let's have a look at what each of these event exclusive moves will be. So, yeah, let's have a look. So, with Pikachu, the uh, series mascot at this point. Hmm. Oops. So 
Pikachu had Surf. Come on, this thing. Can you load this thing any slower? Can you load this thing any slower? Yeah, so Pikachu had Surf, if you caught it. The Draco Meteor was for dragon for evolving dragonair into dragonite frenzied plant was bulbasaur if you got if you got uh, frenzied plant was if you managed to get it from bulbasaur all the way up to ivysaur during the event April had Mareep as the Community Day Pokemon. Can you load any slower? So, yeah, here we go. Um, Ampharos will learn Dragon Pulse which weirdly is a dragon move for some reason uh, then you had Charmander as part of the community day uh, it was just blaze burn which I believe it was Yeah, it was Blazeburn for the almighty Charizard. Shiny Charizard, anybody? <laughs> then you had the June Community Day, which was Larvitar. Evolve that all the way up to your um, Tyranitar. And you got the Smackdown. Which, instead of it being a charged move, it was just a fast TM move. July saw um, Squirt um, Charmander. I saw s not Squirt. Squirtle. July was Squirtle, and I've got my own Squirtle squad. Oh man, that was that was a fun day. Uh, it was Hydro Cannon that was the. Uh, that was the move you could learn. Yeah, Hydro Cannon for the almighty Blast Toys. And then you had cute little Eevee. It's so cute. So cute they had to do it over two days. But still within the three hour period. And it will know a move called Last Resort. And then from there, September's Community Day involved the first of the the first of it was the first of the starter Pokemon for the Johto region, which I believe was.
Chikorita. And again, just like Venusaur, Frenzy Plant, if you manage to evolve it through its, through its evolution forms. October saw Beldum evolving that into Metagross. Meteor Mash was the exclusive move you could get for it. And last, but by no means least, you had Cyndaquil. You had Cyndaquil, uh, which was Blast Burn as well, just like Charizard. Now, the shiny Pokemon I've got, the shiny Community Day Pokemon I managed to get was Pikachu, Dratini, the Pikachus, the Dratinis. I don't have a shiny Pichu yet, folks. Um, Pikachu, uh, Pikachu Raichu, Dratini, Dragonair, Dragonite. Um, Charmander, Charaz uh, Charmeleon, Charizard. Squirt, uh, Larvitar, uh, uh, Poplar, Tyranitar, um, Squirtle, War Turtle, Blast Toys, and then Cyndaquil, um, Quivla, and Typhlosion. So I've got all those. So far. Anyway, here's here's my chance to get the rest. Right. Will we see a PC release of Red Dead Redemption 2? Let's find out. Will we ever see Red Dead Redemption 2 on PC? Rockstar's open world western game Red Dead Redemption 2 launched to huge acclaim in late October with a newly launched online mode now in beta alongside the epic-sized single-player campaign. So far, however, the game is only available on Xbox One and PS4. While that's not exactly restrictive, a restricted release, the committed PC, committed PC players have been left twiddling their thumbs in the vague hope of a PC port coming down the line. Players hungry for a high-spec or 4K experience can opt to play the game on the PS4 Pro or Xbox One X. There's nothing quite like a souped-up PC rig to bring out the finer details of what Rockstar's game engine can really do. So if you don't have a console for, from Sony or Microsoft, what are your prospects for getting your hands on Red Dead 2 anytime soon? We've run through all the latest rumours pointing to a PC release and made our best guess as to when we'd expect it to land. Will we see Red Dead 2 on PC? Rumours kicked off in mid-October about a possible Red Dead 2 PC release after online retail and media marked Mark, Mark T released a PC version of the game on its website with a placeholder date of December 31st, 2019. The listing has since been pulled, however. Things heated up again after LinkedIn prof a LinkedIn profile for a Rockstar employee appeared to list credits as a programmer on the PC version of the game, though this again was amended after the media attention that attracted. The firmest clues we have, appe the firmest clues we have appeared when Rockstar released a mobile tablet companion app alongside the new Red Dead game, mainly as a hub for viewing in-game stats, journal entries, and map locations. See image below. Some savvy data mining, though, contained references to PC quality graphics settings, shadow quality, grass rendering, and the like, and the like as well as explicitly naming PC, such as PA RAM, Companion Autocorrect IP, uh, Companion Autocorrect IP PC, or Command is PC version in bracket void. You can see the full list on Rockstar Intel. I'm not even gonna go into details on that. There's also a reference to Oculus, which can only really refer to VR compat capability for the game given the option to play the entire game as an immersive first-person perspective. 
in an immersive first person perspective virtual reality would be a natural fit and red dead 2 vr would be most at home on a dedicated oculus or pc bound headset red dead 2 released pc red dead 2 on pc release date so when could we see red dead 2 on pc at this point, Rockstar is unlikely to make an announcement before the end of 2018. If anything, an announcement in January could be a savvy move to keep interest in the next in the new to keep up interest in the new year. While 2010's Red Dead Redemption never came to PC, previous Rockstar games like GTA 4 or GTA 5 took around six months to make the jump to PC after their initial console launch. So that means we could be looking at an April-May 2019 launch date this time around. Given the scale of the open world game, it's not wholly surprising for a PC port to follow a few months later. It takes a lot of work to get the game running on different systems, but it, but the longer the PC gamers have to wait, the less likely they are to maintain their anticipation. And if the game gets delayed too long, it may end up competing with CD Projekt Red, similarly open, similarly open world Cyberpunk 2077, which is expected to release in early 2019. Sure. The open plays of Rockstar's Western seem a world away from a neon Blade Runner-esque dystopia, but gamers only have so much time on their hands, and both developers are and both developers are unlikely to want to be competing directly. Well So does this mean could we be seeing a Red Dead 2 on PC later down the road? Answer? I think so. And as I am recording this, I just received something through from one of my friends, John Douglas, sending me the article. Thank you very much. Just recording the podcast. Right now. Good to know, John. Thank you very much. Red Dead Online beta progress may not carry over once fully released. Well, the Red Dead Online aspect, anyway. Here we go. With the Red Dead Online beta being available for many, it's times it's time for fans for the Western game to enjoy some of the more social aspects that the title has to offer. The potential downside. All of that progress might not carry over when Red Dead Online officially launches. The team over at Rockstar Games provided an extensive outline for what's next to be for what's next, but tucked away at the very end of their latest blog post was a warning of potential lost progress, according to the site. We hope that all player progress during this early period of the beta will be able to remain intact long term. However, as with many betas for large-scale online experiences such as this, there is always the chance that we may need to implement rank or other stat resets in case of issues. Okay, you do tend to be, you do tend to expect that sort of thing, but hey, I can live with that. The good news is that lo- the good news is that it looks like keeping everything intact is a priority for the studio, even if it may not totally be an assured thing. Still, with so much to do within Red Dead Online, it would be nice to know that. All of that hard work will carry over. To make sure that servers aren't overwhelmed, given the amount of interest in Red Dead in what Red Dead Online has to offer, the studio is handling the release of beta access in a very particular way. Rockstar Game tells us. Ah. So here we go. So this is how the beta rolled out. Tuesday, November 27th. All all Red Dead Redemption 2 Ultimate Edition owners. Please note players who purchase the physical Ultimate Edition must redeem the Ultimate Edition code in the packaging to be eligible. Here we go. Wednesday, November 28th. All players who played Red Dead Redemption 2... All players who played Red Dead Redemption 2 on October 26th according to our date. Tuesday, Thursday, November 29th. All Red Dead... All players who played Red Dead Redemption 2 between October 26th to October 29th, according to our data. And then, now, today, all players who own Red Dead Redemption 2. Gradual rollout on the beta. Well played, Rockstar. 
The studio added, we are aiming to deliver a stable and fun experience while collecting as much crucial information and feedback as possible to help us continually improve Red Dead Online. As with any beta period, we plan to take the time necessary to th throughout to make Red Dead Online a complete, fun, and fully functional experience, which may take several weeks or months as we continually work to fix bugs, improve systems, and implement player feedback into current or future plans. For those that have the Red Dead Redemption 2 Ultimate Edition, it's time to get started because this feature is available for you right now! As for the game itself, Red Dead Redemption 2 is available on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. I've just spotted something on this same article regarding Overwatch. So, this is going to be interesting. So, here we go. Let's get started and let's get ready to rumble. Here we go. Yeah, 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 whatever. Here we go. A glitch in Overwatch, interestingly. So let's have a look. Nerf this. What the fridge? That is absolutely brilliant. thought I'd come across this? Right, so yeah, I reported a few weeks ago on the Spiral Reignited Trilogy not being complete in its physical form. So here we go. With the release of Spiral Reignited Trilogy, a question has been bugging many fans of the physical medium. Why isn't the entire trilogy on the disc? Activision! Is it ethical for a company like Activision to charge this much for a classic collection, even if it's in even if the entirety of it isn't accessible unless a mandatory download is performed? Let's look at the facts first and foremost. A misconception was that the first Spiral Dragon was on the disc, whereas Ripto's Rage and Year of the Dragon are downloaded via an included code. That information is not right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumbledumb
Comparing linear levels to a sprawling 3D environment isn't fair to begin with. Not to mention that with the different with the different lighting effects and other bells and and other bells and whistles, it is a beautiful game to look at. Add to that its scale, and th then it's easy to understand why it would need all the space necessary to run. The only other way this situation can be remedied is following the steps of Rockstar. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the largest file-sized base game of the generation, towering well over 100 gigabytes on the PlayStation 4. To fit the colossal Western on one disc is, as aforementioned, rather impossible. Rockstar, in turn, opt to have the game released with two discs. This is rather unprecedented. This is a rather unprecedented practice that has not been done since the days of the Xbox 360, or to an earlier degree, PlayStation RPGs like Final Fantasy VII. One disc serves as the main disc to which players start off their game, and the other just adds additional data. This method was also this method was also done with Halo 4 on the Xbox 360. Why didn't you do this, Activision? Oh, I know, because you're idiots. So if Rockstar is capable of releasing a game on two discs, why isn't Activision doing the same with Star Spyro? Because they are idiots! It's not that Activision is an indie company publishing one of the biggest entertainment products in history, Call of Duty, which is a waste of time! So why couldn't they do it? BECAUSE THEY ARE IDIOTS! Well, there are a couple of possible reasons. Number one, they are idiots. And number two, they are idiots. The first is that Blu-ray's discs aren't cheap like CDs or DVDs, since they carry much more data than their prime primordial counterparts. They are often utilised by big movie studios than independent filmmakers. I do not know what the exact number. I do not know the exact numbers, but I have been told that Blu-ray prices aren't low. While we have discussed that Activision may have the money, this leads to the key reason why they aren't doing it. It's Spyro. As much as the Purple Dragon is beloved by many around the world, it wasn't a household name anymore. In other words, Activision flips you off! Red Dead, or any Rockstar release for that matter, has been proven to be a, megat a megaton seller. So what? So it was a risk worth taking, considering the gargantuan task of both the original Red Dead Redemption and GTA V, it was a pretty low risk. The Spiral franchise, on the other hand, has been in a slump for quite a while. His original games have been regarded as gems, but it's 2018, and it's hard to estimate how many people would purchase the collection since gaming has grown significantly since 1998. Um, hello? Did you see how well Crash Bandicoot sold? Did you see how well that trilogy sold? On top of that, the publisher decided to go with a lower price point on the collection with an... with an MRSP... M MSRP market recommended sale price? I don't know. Of $39.99. $40. At the end of the day, while it's a shame players have to download BP file sizes to fully experience Spyro's adventures, it's a small price to pay. Especially since there have been worse cases of the ratio between data on disk to obligatory download before. Super Lucky's Tale, anyone? I didn't have this issue because I managed to download it through Game Pass. Spyro Reignited Trilogy has been a collection that people have been clamouring since Crash got a similar treatment a year and a half ago. While the download wall is an annoying obstacle to climb over, at least the consolation is, is that beyond it lies a delightful throwback to the glory days of 3D platforming that anyone should experience. This is why I hate you, Activision. This is why you are part of the gaming screw-up of the weak band, alongside EA and Konami and anyone else that screws up. You. Are. Idiots. Because you're just like this. Thank you, Mr. Krabs. You're not much better. how the last few articles have been connected in some way. Uh, Red Dead Redemption, we've talked about that, there's file size, and then of course about Spyro with the file size issues. And we're back to Red Dead Redemption 2. How to find the Red Dead Redemption Ku Klux Klan and laugh away from controversy. 
One of the most controversial and hilarious elements of Red Dead Redemption 2 is the KKK. Here we go! There are plenty of oddities in the world of Red Dead Redemption 2. It turns out that when Rockstar creates a wild, wild west, it can be a strange, strange place full of curious... curios and characters that are so unforgettable and possible and possibly the most controversial of these is the Red Dead Redemption 2 KKK. It's one of the most bizarre Red Dead Redemption chance encounters is it's one of the most red most bizarre Red Dead Redemption count, chance encounters. <sighs> Proofreading guys, have you learned to do it? One of the most bizarre Red Dead Redemption chance encounters is one you kind of have to let happen on its own. You find them by accident as you stroll through the red uh, stroll around the Red Dead Redemption 2 map uh, near Southfield Flats, to be precise, just by roads. But then they're also going to appear elsewhere across the locale. Interestingly, you kind of want to just sit back and enjoy, but you'll have to watch the video below. To find out why. Now, obviously, I can't show the footage because it'll be copyright. It'll be content ID'd by Rockstar right out of the gate. But let's have a look at it anyway. So he's showing us where we go. To the fools in Congress uh, and their ludicrous ideas. Uh, ludicrous ideas. Today, we grow one yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. as we anoint a new brother yeah. into yeah. our sacred cult. Yeah. Please step yeah. forward and kneel. In weapon greet antagonize. <laughs> oh boy, what's gonna happen here? Stranger. Hello, stranger. Hello, stranger. What are you buying? <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> and two of the KKK end up on fire. And they get twisted. Alive. And this Feedback. guy. Maybe that's a sign. A test. That's all. A test of devotion to our great cause. By burning them alive? You're just a bunch of morons in ridiculous outfits. Which makes you the prize moron. You dirty son of a bitch! I'll show you! Uh, Why don't you just shoot him? Thing, we'll leave it at that. That's very pleasant to know, Arthur. Very pleasant. That's just one of the hilarious encounters we've had in Red Dead Redemption 2 so far. The world is full of little stories like these, and we've started collate collating some of the random encounters we've had under the Twitter hashtag Red Dead Stories. So if you have any of your own that you want to share, then let us know. But for now, just head out on your trusty steed and get to know the world of Red Dead Redemption. Trust me, you're going to enjoy it. That's my best, that's my best cowboy. That's my best cowboy voice, boy. Oh boy. Oh boy, you just that one. And, ooh, um... 
A uh, small question. Anyone have kids that play Fortnite? Well, I would suggest moderating the time that they are on Fortnite Frontier are announced because if they spend too much time, according to this article, they end up going to rehab for addiction! my power pack that is gonna come in handy for tomorrow tomorrow i love your tomorrow you're only a day away and a thank you a thank you thank you you're too kind ladies and gentlemen you are too kind It's a shame I'm not going to be able to do this until 2019. Because I'm looking forward to a long, well-deserved break. I've put out over 300 videos this year. And like I, and like I said in my video, in my Spider-Man playthrough video yesterday, that I'm just going to be finishing up some projects, finishing up the group stage of the Rocket League, Champions League, um... Just getting a couple more races for F1 2018 out of the way as well. And then just taking it from there. Anyway. Um. Anyway, here we go. Young Fortnite players being sent to rehab for addiction. Fantastic. About time we got some negative publicity for Fortnite. This is the dangers of playing Fortnite, ladies and gentlemen. Since it's one of the most popular games of all, <coughs> to quote Jules from uh, What Culture, since it's one of the most popular games in his, since it's one of the most popular games in history, not just in history. Say it with me, kids, of all time. It seems as if Fortnite is either breaking a record or changing the way the public views video games on any given week, from becoming the most watched game on Twitch. To being the game that's earned Ninja over $500,000 a month. Fortnite, Fortnite constantly makes headlines and constantly gets covered on this podcast. Unfortunately, some of these headlines are related to video game addiction. Fantastic! While Fortnite is, one of, is only one of the many games to be regarded as a cause for video game addiction, its recent popularity has made it one of the leading referenced causes for addiction in both younger and older gamers. However, because of Fortnite aims to appeal to a younger audience, too many parents are finding that their kids' lives are consumed by it. Have you seen... How many kids do you see that don't do the dances from Fortnite? That's where they got the floss from. A, con a candidate on The Apprentice did the floss after his team won the task. I've done the floss before as well. I've done a couple of Fortnite dances while playing, bo while bowling. Not with Roman from GTA 4, James. Sadly for some parents, the addiction has too tight of a grasp on their kids, and they have been forced to turn to rehab for help. In a recent interview, one mother revealed their son spent 12 hours every day during playing Fortnite. As a result, he constantly sleeps in class, and in turn his grades have dropped significantly. She stated that she never seen a game that has this much control over kids' minds. This stance has been echoed by a multitude of parents around the globe many of whom have been forced to send their kids to rehab. This is not the first time Fortnite has been cited as a chief cause of problems at home. Two months ago, it was revealed that Fortnite was cited in over 200 UK divorce court cases. Oh my word! Regarding Fortnite, British behavioural specialist Lorraine Mera stated, This game is like heroin. Once you are hooked, it's hard to get unhooked. This isn't the first instance of games being compared to heroin, as a recent study showed gaming should be a gaming could be as addictive as heroin. This lines up with the World Health Organization's recent classification of compulsive gaming as a mental health disorder. Well, now that a case like this has actually popped up, World Health Organization? Okay. 
I'll take my hat off to you because who knew when something like this would happen? Who knew Fortnite would be this popular? Regardless of a person's stance on compulsive gaming, or Fortnite for that matter, the fact that many parents feel the need to send their kids to rehab for addiction is tragic. It raises many questions, including whether or not more parents should strongly enforce age restrictions on certain games. Simple! Here's a simple solution. LOOK AT THE AGE RATINGS ON THE FREAKING BOXES, Damn it! THE AGE RATINGS ARE THERE FOR A REASON! Anyway, last piece of news before we get into our last section of the year, Death Stranding will ship out in June according to the eternal enigma that is Walmart Canada. So here we go. So here we go. A new window for Death Stranding's long-awaited arrival may have finally been revealed by the reflexive fit of incompetence and or internet comedy. It involves the Game Awards, a sharp-eyed fan, and who else but Walmart Canada! The same regional branch of the mega retailer that infamously leaked Rage 2 among several other announcements last year. It all started with a tweet from host and producer Jeff Keighley. Tonight we, start tra Tonight we start transitioning into the Game Awards, World Premier Land. There are a lot of games we won't be talking about at until the show. All eyes on you, Walmart Canada! Oh, <laughs> quite jab at them! Nicely done! But we do have some great things to tease and announce in the week ahead. Then Twitter user Yon Yonob brought up the Walmart Canada listing for Death Stranding! which sets the game's release date as June 30th, 2019. Compare that to the Walmart US listing for Death Stranding, which currently has a more obvious placeholder date of December 31st, 2018. Yanob just tweeted saying, ELABORATE PLEASE! Walmart Canada just tweeted that out. It wasn't even tagged in Yanob's response. And now we're left with so many questions. Was Walmart Canada's Twitter simply robotically repeating the detail the details listed on its product page? For Death Stranding? Was it poking fun at its own complicity in the leaks of last year by by sticking with what it knows is only a placeholder? Or was this all pre-arranged behind the scenes by Keeley, Hideo Kojima, and Walmart Canada's social team as a pre-announcement tease for Death Stranding? Which is likely to get a which is likely to get another reveal of another reveal of some kind at the Game Awards. I find myself saying this a lot lately, but that does totally sound like the kind of thing Hideo, I'm going to pretend to be a heavily <laughs> Oh my f- <laughs> This is the longest nickname in the world! Hideo, I'm going to pretend to be a heavily bandaged man named Joachim Mo- Joachim Mogren Kode Kojima would, p would pull. We'll soon- we'll find out soon enough. The Game Awards are set to air one week from now on Thursday, December 6th and more Kojima weirdness is always worth looking forward to. Oh boy. And now, the big question now is are we going to see a 3 to 1 ratio or a 4 to 1 ratio? Not right. Not 2 to 1 ratio. Thanks. 
Is it going to be a 3 to 1 ratio or a 4 to 1 ratio? Not right. Damn it. One more time. Is it going to be a 3 to 1 ratio or a 2 to 1 ratio? Let's find out in our last Battle of the Free game, this time for December 2018. <laughs> So, since Microsoft won last month, making it 8-3, they get the advantage of going first. Now, I'm using the IGN page just to make things a little easier for myself. So we got the games with gold for December, which actually tomorrow, no less. Cube 2, that's Q-U-B-E 2. Never Alone, and those games are both on the Xbox One. Dragon Age 2 on Xbox 360, which is back, which will be backwards compatible on Xbox 360. I've got Dragon Age Origins. I can get Dragon Age 2, and then uh, later down the road get Inquisition, because I love my Bioware stuff. And Mercenaries Playground of Destruction. It says on IG, the IGN page that it's a 360 game, but it is actually an original Xbox game. Fantastic! Our first original Xbox game on the Games with Gold me, program. PlayStation, on the other hand, ooh, goody. We've got some juicy, juicy, juicy games here. We've got Soma, which is a horror game, which will be on PlayStation 4. Onrush, which I've played, and it's pretty, it's pretty good. Uh, PlayStation 3 owners will have Steradan, and Steins Gate. On the Vita, you've got Iconoclasts and Papers, please! Boom! 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 I took that from Jack Sexy Papers, please is brilliant. Dictate! Get out of here! Nothing, we're gonna deny this, and we're gonna give you a reason why. Now get out of my line! Next! Check out Jacksepticeye's playthrough of that, uh, of that game. It is absolutely brilliant. He gives the game so much personality and the characters just, well, so much character. Oh boy. Anyway, that's that. Sony may not have the greatest lineup of games throughout 2018. But they managed to finish on a high note. Sony make it 8-4. Meaning, while, X while Microsoft have the superior lineup of games throughout 2018, PlayStation managed to claw back with a win to make it a 2-1 to ratio on wins throughout the year. Which means Sony get the advantage of going first when it comes to January 2019. Which will be, um, which will be on a set, which would be on the first episode of season two of the Trophy Achievement Podcast, January 2019. Definitely take note. Definitely, definitely keep yourself tuned in for that. In the meantime, that's the end of season. That's the end of season one of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you did, as always, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the Latter Day Saints notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. I've got Spider Man on the left. I've got my podcast playlist on the right. Apprentice tomorrow. Formula One on Sunday, and then. For the month of December, I'm just going to be finishing up whatever I'm doing. I'll be finishing Spider-Man on the original PlayStation. I'll be getting my reactions to this, to the, um, I'll be getting my Walking Dead reactions done because I've still got three episodes to do. I'll get all them up. Uh, I've got the Rocket League Champions League to finish. So pretty much I'm just going to be fin, pretty much whatever I get, whatever goes up over the next week or, over the next uh, week or so. It's just going to be finishing up those projects. Uh, I'm also going to be finishing everything wrong with The Apprentice as well. There's three weeks to go. Uh, 
So yeah, definitely stay tuned. Uh, like I say, make sure you click that bell to join the notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on the channel. So, all that's left to say is uh, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow with Everything on the Apprentice and then I'll see you on Sunday for F1 2018 where we head to La Donna Barbier, I'm off to Italy. Anyway, see you all, enjoy the rest of your day, peace out and stay faithful as always.